Nick Crawl won the trade deadline, and we will tell you why on today's live Locked On Reds. You are Locked On Reds, your daily Cincinnati Reds podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. You are Locked on Reds, the live edition, folks. Thanks for making Locked on Reds your first listen of the day. Most days we're a little bit late today because it's trade deadline day. Locked on Reds podcast is part of the Locked on Podcast Network. And we are free and available on all podcasting platforms. I am your host, Stephen Offenbaker, alongside Jeff Carr, and we have a passion for baseball. We have a passion for the Cincinnati Reds, and we have taken that passion and turned it into information for you. Jeff and I combined over eight years of podcasting experience talking about these Cincinnati Reds. On today's show, we are going to break down the trade deadline. We are going to tell you who went where, what we got back, why Nick Crawl's work is not done yet, and we are going to take your questions a little bit later in the show about this massive acquisition of talent that occurred today for the Cincinnati Reds. All right, Jeff, we should probably just dive right in to what happened today. There were a lot of significant moves. A lot of fan favorites have gone to other teams. Uh, A lot of talent has left Cincinnati today, but the future that was already looking bright is just white hot bright right now. Uh, There is a lot of talent coming back to Cincinnati in the form of prospects. Yeah, Nick Crawl did exactly what he said he would do and went out and got some talent. We're talking about a lot of dudes that for the next three or four years are going to be coming up through the Reds farm system and making their major league debuts, especially when you look at that Tyler Maui trade. That started things off when you're talking about the quickly brought up major league talent guys. Coming back from the Minnesota Twins is infielder Spencer Steer and third baseman Christian Encarnacion Strand. They also got a pitcher in there by the name of Steven Hajar, left-handed pitcher. But the two guys that I mentioned before are awesome, awesome power hitters. Guys that really, there's some that think that Steer could be up at the end of this year, and then Encarnacion Strand could be on the opening day roster next year, which signed me up for guys who have the talent and are ready to be up now. You know, I, I completely agree. And, and and this deal with the twins for Tyler Malley, you know, I was a little worried and I've stayed away from this conversation uh, while the trade deadline was playing out. But I was a little bit worried that because one team was already automatically excluded from from bidding on Malley and that's the Toronto Blue Jays, that that would drive his value down a little bit and people weren't going to pay as much. And I'm happy to see that Nick Craw was able to still get a, a significant haul for him in return in finding a partner with the Minnesota Twins. You know, we talked about that it might be the Yankees. It might be the Yankees. Yankees didn't get Castillo. We thought, okay, well, maybe the Yankees are going to get Mali. They didn't. They went the other direction with probably the only other viable big name arm that was out there after Luis Castillo. So, uh, you know, what's interesting to me is that it wasn't the Dodgers. Uh, I think that, that that surprised me a little bit. But, you know, I guess that uh, at the end of the day, the Minnesota Twins have decided that they're not messing around, uh, much like the San Diego Padres decided today that they're not messing around. And, uh, you know, I'm here for it. Uh, this really, I think, in the in the grand scheme of things, uh, gave the, the Reds, you know, a, a, a level 1B talent infusion uh, in the form of trading away Tyler Malley. Yeah, they're an easy top 10 farm system right now, but that's not necessarily what the goal is. The goal is to win in 2024, and I think that they move toward that goal. Look at what they did with Luis Castillo and Tyler Malley put together. Nick Kroll went out and got seven prospects for those two dudes, and many of those seven guys, like at least four of them, are considered bona fide talents, dudes who are going to help out this team in the next couple of years. Then you also look at the fact that they did make the trade for Brandon Drury. There was a report yesterday that had us a little bit worried that the Reds were working on some kind of contract extension, but that didn't happen. And it's interesting enough, Brandon Drury was sent to the Padres who just decided they wanted to acquire everybody in baseball, including Juan Soto. But the deal that they got back, they got one player back who was a shortstop, an 18-year-old shortstop named Victor Acosta. He was an international signing by the Padres a couple, or I think it was last year. 
and he was for uh, a signing bonus of 1.2 million. So that tells you what you need to know. They really liked the talent that he had to uh, bring to the table. And with all of that, I see lots and lots of good future stuff. I want to tell you, I wasn't just a little bit worried when possible extension talks were were starting to float around. And I was happy to see Nick Crawl kind of shut them down, which I thought was bold. I thought that was actually bold of him to, to come out and say that. And it, it's part, I think, a little bit of this Red's new operating model because I, I was in my head thinking, of course, they're going to extend this guy. They're going to give him a three year deal. They're going to give him a bunch of money and he's going to be terrible next year. That's the, the Cincinnati Reds way. It's always been the Cincinnati Reds way. And they didn't do it. And they shot it down almost immediately when it started to gain traction. And I was I was very appreciative of that because I really was stressing about it. So this deal with the Padres, uh, I said all along, once Brandon Drury became a clear trade chip, you absolutely had to trade that guy. You, you, you have a guy that you brought in for basically nothing that has hit 20 home runs, is having the best year of his career, and we don't know if this is him finally having figured it out and he's going to be good for two or three years or if he is really in an outlier year where everything is clicking. Think uh, Scooter Jeanette as an example, uh, a little uh, a little boost burst of talent followed by a dramatic fall off. Uh, he could be that he could be great. We don't know. And I think what you got to do is you got to go with the information you have right now. And right now we know. He's super valuable. Right now we know people want him. And right now we know that they could flip him for something great in return. And that's exactly what Nick Craw did. You know, these two trades we've talked about now, the Tyler Malley trade and now Brandon Drury. I grade both of these trades as A letter grade. A. Mm -hmm. No, I, I totally agree with you. And in fact, there's lots around baseball that look at what Nick Craw did and said, boy, he won. Now, granted, this is step one. Like this is the end of the whole teardown process. Of course, this past off season, we weren't necessarily fans of what they did and, and the different trades that they made. However, it looks like they flipped the script on it during this season and made a lot of great trades. People are looking at Nick crawl a little bit differently now, including you and I, we, we both have an opinion on him. I didn't have an opinion on him before these trades happen, but now I look at this and I say, okay, let's see what they can do because they spent the last couple of years reorganizing, reorganizing, <laughs> reorganizing their Ooh, farm Jeff. system. It's been a long day, Steve. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, they've done well about putting together their development system, their scouting system. How do these guys develop? And how does Nick crawl move on from here? Because one would think the selling is either over or pretty much almost over. And now you're going to look at how do they start buying, especially when you're talking about the only big contracts that are on the books next year is the uh, one of Mustakis and Joey Votto. I think you're right. I think that for what could be sold off has been sold off. You know, I, I don't know if you saw, I tweeted out earlier today, like, I don't know who needs to hear this, but nobody is taking on Mike Moustakis' contract today. That's <laughs> yeah. not happening. Um, and, and obviously Joey Votto is here for at least one more year. I really would, if Joey wants to still play, I'd love for him to still be here in 2024, but I don't really see that happening. So the rest of the big money contracts are going to take care of themselves by expiring. That's what's going to happen with them. Or someone will feel really bold and they'll cut Moustakis next year. Uh, what needs to happen next? You know, so we talked about this uh, off air, Jeff, but you know, this is just one of the tests for Nick crawl. So, you know, it's, it's, it's not all is forgiven with Nick crawl. It's not, it's not okay. We not think he's an amazing general manager. He's a, an amazing leader of the he's team. He's on the positive saying, side. I, I would yeah, say no, so. but so yeah. So what he's demonstrated is that he can as accept his assignment and he can go out and execute it. Now we've seen this twice. Uh, when he got hired, when he was elevated after Dick Williams left, his first assignment was you get rid of these players, and he was given a list. You cut this money. He was told a number, and he went out and did it public relations nightmare be damned he yeah. went out and did it and then his next mission was we're moving to a new model we're going to try and emulate what some of the more successful rebuild teams do uh, we keep talking about tampa i know other teams do it but they do it the best so he was told be more like that and he went out and did it so he successfully executed mission number two 
So now mission number three is going to be to work with this development staff, work with the farm system, get the right coaches, the right development guys, the right information guys, analytics guys, and bring these prospects along, develop them to, to hit what I think probably the next mission will be is you have to put a winner on the field. And they're going to give him a deadline because they recognize this fan base is only going to tolerate this for just so long. Yeah. So they've got probably 2024, 2025 as a deadline for we need to be in the playoffs. And, and I'm going to tell you what, this team with a couple tweaks, and we'll talk about this either a little bit later today or on a future episode, Jeff, but this team is not very far from being at least a viable last wild card spot team in 2023. Yeah, just a uh, just to recap real fast, the Reds traded Tyler Malley to the Minnesota Twins. They received back infielder Spencer Steer and third baseman Christian Encarnacion Strand, as well as left-handed pitcher Stephen Hajar. Brandon Drury was sent to the Padres. They got back 18-year-old shortstop Victor Acosta. And also something that we will kind of talk about here more in depth, the Reds acquired Austin Romine, a uh, veteran catcher who the Cardinals had just de designated for assignment. They sent cash to the Cardinals. And then they sent Tommy Pham to the Red Sox for a player to be named later or cash, which may just be the cash that they send to. They just might say, hey, have you met the Cardinals? We'll just send you on that way. And then also before today, of course, Tyler Nake went to the Mets and Luis Castillo to the Seattle Mariners. That's a lot, Steve. That's a lot of different stuff, which means there are many holes on this roster. There are many spots where guys are going to need to be plugged in the rest of the way. So we're going to talk about what that looks like and why Aristides Aquino, who's having one heck of a return here tonight, is definitely going to get quite a bit of playing time. That's all coming up after I tell you about the delicious Built Bar. You need to check out Built Bar today because they have everything that you could want in a snack. It's healthy for you. It's covered in 100% real chocolate, and they've got the puffs, man. The puffs are marshmallow. They're collagen-infused marshmallows, so they've got amazing healthy protein, and they've got you know pretty low calories, around 160 calories, low sugar, low carbs. It fits into every single diet you can think of. And they have cookie dough chunk puff. Yes, that is a marshmallow bar with chunks of cookie dough covered in 100% real chocolate that will fit right into whatever diet you got going on. Head on over to built.com today. I've had a cookie dough chunk puff and I can't recommend them anymore. I mean, I, I've got so many awesome taste buds that just die for a cookie dough chunk puff. Check them out today, built.com. Use the promo code LOCK15 as well to save 15% off your next order. Built also has amazing flavors like s'mores puffs. They've got non-puff bars like granola bars. They've got great stuff. One of my favorite non-puff bars is the mint chocolate brownie. Check that out today as well. That's built.com. Use the promo code LOCK15. You'll save 15% off your next order of the amazingly healthy and awesomely delicious built bar. Thanks for making Locked On Reds your uh, first listen today. We're live in prime time, so we might not be your first listen, but if we are, thank you. Thanks for checking us out. And tomorrow we are going to really dive into what this roster looks like. But Steve, I want to kind of take a quick look right here because after all of these moves, there's plenty of open spots, and that definitely starts off when you look at the fact that there's some guys coming back from injury who are going to fit into this pitching staff, into this outfield. Where kind of do you want to begin with that list? It's, it's, a, lot, it's a lot to digest. There's a lot of moving parts that are, are going to happen. And just for everybody watching live, we appreciate you being here. Drop your questions in the comment sections. We will get to them upcoming. Uh, Carrick, will, Carrick Melvin is watching over on YouTube. He has something we're going to dig into coming up here in just a few minutes. Uh, but with what's left now, Jeff, uh, obviously we see that uh, R.C. Zucchino is back in the lineup uh, for – whatever is his 15th opportunity to try and reclaim a, a spot on this roster. Uh, I think we can start right there with him because he's having himself a night, you know, he's already uh, delivered at the plate. He both offensively and defensively throwing a guy out from the outfield. And, and that's really what he brings to this team. He is uh, a, a pretty talented defender. And if he could just somehow put it all together 
in a way to be a fourth outfielder. He could be useful around here for a couple of years, uh, but I, I still am not sold on the idea that he can uh, put things together in a way to be a starter. No, and I, I think this team is full of fourth outfielders right now, Steve. And as much as I like Jake Fraley, I think that he probably profiles as a fourth outfielder at best on the 2024 side. You've got Albert Almora, who it's been nice to see him back off the I.L., I don't think we're talking about, you know, a future outfielder for the Reds, but for this season and next season, you know, as well as what they might do in the off season, what does this team look like? And yes, Aristides Aquino is going to be one of the headliners when it comes to playing time, what we're going to see from him performance wise, but we know what we know about him. And I don't necessarily think we're going to learn anything new about him. He's going to get breaking balls alone away. He's going to swing at him and he's going to miss it. That, that's just who he is at the plate. And in the field, he's awesome. Fast, good arm. You love that. There's also another guy that's coming off the IL, some dude that I want to see more of because coming into this season, you and I both agreed that this was like bullpen ace 1B, and that's Luis Sessa. Luis Wait, Sessa, it didn't work out that way. <laughs> no, it didn't. No, it sure didn't because he's had a rough year and a lot of that's had to do with different injury stints and things like that. But also when he's been healthy, he's given up lots of home runs and things like that. So how does he pitch the rest of the way is going to go a long way for, you know, at least next year. I mean, I think he is probably on this team next year, but he's definitely not a guy that I'm sold on for the future. Yeah. And, and I mean, let's be honest, he doesn't really have to do a whole lot to be in the top tier of this Reds bullpen <laughs> right now. So um, if, if he can come out and deliver us, deliver a sub four ERA, eh. Uh, the rest of the season that's that's elite for this bullpen so uh i don't think there's a lot of pressure on him is what i'm saying uh, i think he can come out hopefully he's had some time to rest up and and review film and figure out exactly what it was that was not working for him before he went on the injured list and, and right this ship a little bit you know relievers are wonky we always talk about the fact that they're just a little bit off anyway and right. you can never really count on a guy unless their name was like mariano rivera to be consistently year in and year out that guy for you so you know we we see it with these relievers and their talent they're they're great then they're not then they're great then they're not so hopefully uh he's heading into a their great phase of the season and can have some success because listen outside of baseball Luis Sessa is a great guy he's fun to follow you know he, he he's a big time family man his family travels with him all season mm -hmm. and and you see them out and about uh, wherever the Reds are at so you know personally I'm pulling for the guy uh is it a reasonable expectation to think he'll be that one B that one you know I think so I think we're talking about Diaz the rest of the way and then we're talking about Sessa. And what that means is thank you, thank you, thank you. No more Hunter Strickland in the ninth inning is what that means. <laughs> yes, I, I definitely am done seeing him pitch when it comes to the ninth inning. Another pitcher that we're looking at is Justin Dunn. He has officially been added to the rotation. A guy that we've been wanting to see all season long. Now he came over to the Reds. He was already hurt. He already had the shoulder problem. And coming back from the shoulder uh, surgery, that is. And how is he going to look for the red legs? Because it's going to go a long way in how we evaluate the trade with the Mariners. Because right now, I don't know if you've seen the way that Jesse Winker and Eugenio Suarez have played. If he and Jake Fraley can kind of take off this season, people might actually start to reevaluate that trade now. And not just waiting for Brandon Williamson and for Connor Phillips to figure out how their MLB futures look. But I'm excited to see a lot of Justin Dunn pitching every fifth day. Justin Dunn is, is kind of a wild card. He came over already a bit injured. Mm -hmm. We haven't gotten a good look at him. To evaluate this first trade, I can't say this trade with Seattle. Which one, Steve? Uh, this, <laughs> yeah. To evaluate the, the Jesse Winker, Eugenio Suarez trade with the Mariners, it's still going to take five years for all of the prospects yeah. that came back to really show us who they are and see if they're going to make it to the major leagues. All that being said, yes, there is a little bit, I'm sure, pressure on Dunn to be the first guy to deliver from that deal. And from a Reds front office perspective, they are very, very, very hopeful that Dunn goes out there and does some stuff. That he goes out there and is a contributor to this rotation and looks good because you're right. 
if he's terrible, if he has a bad, if he has a bad half season here coming up, uh, it turns the heat up on what Nick Crawl did, and it and it changes the way people look at that deal already. And that's not fair, but it will. So, so for me, I think he's going to be pitching with a little bit of pressure on him. I think that he not only has something to prove air quotes uh, in that regard, but again, he's been injured. He also is trying to come out and prove that he's a healthy, viable major league pitcher, pitcher, just in general, just in, in, in himself and what he can contribute. And, you know, he's coming into a rotation and he's replacing Luis Castillo. So no pressure there at all. (laughs) No pressure at all. Plus you've also got the catching situation, which has been super fluid ever since Tyler Stevenson's injury and who replaces Brandon Drury. Because there, there's a couple of questions that we need to answer there. And we've also got some questions from you. If you would drop your questions into the chat uh, area, we will answer those coming up here in just a moment. But before we do that, we wanted to let you know you can follow us on Twitter at Jeff Carr with three F's, and you can follow Steve at S. Offenbager with two F's. And because, you know, the more F's, the better. And then you can also follow at Locked On Reds. There's no F's in that one, though, but sometimes you don't have any F's, and that's okay, too. Whenever you're looking at this roster, catcher has been a problem all year. Uh, Tyler Stevenson has been hurt multiple times, and there's a debate that we will have the rest of this season, in the offseason, and in spring training next year about whether or not he should remain a catcher. Spoiler alert, he shouldn't. And... There are some dudes who have been backing him up that just have been very fluid and very unimpressive and nobody's really stood out. So they go out, they make a a move for a veteran catcher, something that they hadn't really done all year. They, they brought in Michael Papierski because he had some major league time. I've not been impressed with him. I don't know about you, but Austin Romine has seen plenty of playing time in a couple of different spots. They get him for cash from the St. Louis Cardinals. And now I'm interested to see what he can bring to the table for the Reds. You know, bringing in Romine, yay. Okay, great. Um, it's 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 a long time late in in doing something to address this catcher situation. This is one of those, this is one of those things where Nick Crawl I think needs to improve because I think that for all that he's done right in the acquisition of prospects, um, he has demonstrated that he still has a little bit to learn about roster construction. I think. Uh, the catching situation proved that. For those that did not see uh, the injury to Tyler Stevenson, you know, he broke the clavicle, uh, initially reported as clean break. It's going to heal in four to six weeks. He might even be back this year. Yeah, that's out the window, guys. Uh, that bone shifted after the break, ended up having to have surgery to repair it, and he's not coming back this season, and that's bad. So uh, kudos for Crawl going out and getting somebody with some experience to do some catching because it's been painful to watch Papierski and Colesberry back there uh, not be able to knock down pitches, not be able to throw out runners, not be able to hit the baseball with consistency and power. Uh, it's been a problem. Now, is, is, is the new guy going to be better? I don't know. I think he's going to be able to stop the baseball when the pitchers throw it, and that is automatically an upgrade. For me, uh, this is a, this is a bandaid and it's designed to yeah. be a bandaid. It's nothing flashy. Uh, but uh, you know, he, he's going to get a lot of playing time. He's going to mm-hmm. play a lot. I, I think he immediately becomes catcher number one, the rest of the season and, uh, good for him. That gives him an opportunity to showcase himself. If he performs well, he could become catcher number two next year keep him around. Uh, if he's not great, the Reds really don't have a lot invested in him. They can get rid of him. So this is a great Band-Aid move. It, it addresses, I think, some mistakes that Crawl made, like sending Sandy Leon to Cleveland for cash when he was the only experienced major league catcher in the system. Uh, that was not smart. So right. that's where I think on the catcher situation, uh, there's a lot of long-term issues to address there, but you know they've Band-Aided their way through 2022. Well, I think it's important too, as the season, you know, really starts heading into the home stretch and things for the Reds, who is behind the plate to help these young pitchers develop? Because that is the key storyline for the Reds moving forward is Hunter Green, Nick Lodolo and Graham Ashcraft, Graham Ashcraft pitching pretty well early on tonight here in Miami, but who is going to be behind the plate there? Because I don't trust Michael Papierski to do that. I don't trust Mark Colesvary to do that. The, uh, Mike, uh, Mark Colesvary is trying to cut his teeth at the major league level and prove that he can stay here. He doesn't have time to worry about, you know, young pitchers too. So I, I'm not convinced that either of those guys are the answer 
um, when it comes to behind the plate. So yes, Austin Romine, good move. Then we also mentioned Drury is now gone. Who replaces him on the roster? I'm not necessarily talking about his production. That is a conversation for another day. Something we'll probably touch on tomorrow. But when we're talking about his spot on the roster, are we calling up Jose Barrero? Are we bringing back up Alejo Lopez? We kind of have some options here that none of them necessarily jump out at you. No, they don't. And I had kind of hoped that there would be two infield openings, but it, it didn't it didn't materialize. And we'll Should talk we... about that coming up in a minute here. Yep, yep, yep. But to to your point, uh, I think it's got to be Jose Barrero. Um, yeah. Look, I know he's not done anything that's impressive at triple a um and he's not done anything that's impressive in the major leagues in the time that he's been given so right. this is what i want them to do i want them to call him up i want them to play him every day i want him to sink have the rest of this season to sink or swim and at the end of this season if he has continued to not perform well then you know you know the answer is let's get matt mcclain up here as quickly as possible because he's going to be the shortstop of the future not jose barrero uh then you send jose barrero back down you stick him in the outfield in louisville and you hope that he figures it out somewhere along the way uh, but they need to answer that question because uh, Matt McClain has started to turn it on at double A Chattanooga. It's not going to be long that he's not going to deserve to be moved to triple A. Now, does that happen this season? Uh, Matt McClain has moved a lot in the last year as far as upward movement through this farm system. That might be pushing it just a little bit to send him to triple A this year. But you can bet that that's where he's going to start next year uh, following what's going to be a spring training invite. And you never know what happens with those spring training invites. He may go in there and pull a Jonathan in. India and basically perform in a way that demands that he start. So uh, Barrero has this window. This is his last chance. This is his time to deliver something. And I think the Reds should give him that chance. And I agree. I mean, he has to sink or swim now. And I don't necessarily know that you know everything that you need for a player in the, you know, month and a half that we're going to have left here or two months that we're going to have left here of baseball. I guess we go a couple of days into October. So yeah, it's two months. Um, but when you look at Jose Barrero, the Reds have added a gajillion shortstops. And actually this kind of goes along with what we're talking about. Got a question from Tyler. And with all of these different shortstops that they got back, yes, they're going to be moved around. It's not as if we're going to keep all these shortstop in the same position, but Nick crawl said he wants to build from the center of the field out. He wants shortstops and then he can move them into other positions. If Jose Barrero proves that he cannot play uh, every day in the lineup, then he's got a lot of talent behind him that's going to be pushing him. And that's not necessarily the Reds were acquiring all these shortstop because they weren't sure about Jose Barrero. It's more of an organizational philosophy now. But he has to be feeling the pressure on that because for years now, he has been the shortstop of the future. I think he was the shortstop of the future in 2020 and in 2021 and this year. And for injuries or, you know, one reason or another, we still haven't found the answer to that. And you stop being the shortstop of the future at a certain point. And I think we've reached that point where he needs to sink or swim or he's no longer the shortstop of the future. Yeah, I think I, I think that's the case. And, and let's talk about this acquisition of shortstops. Uh, when you look when you look at these players, Jeff, I mean, I think if you think all around athlete, you think shortstops and center fielders. Those are the two guys on the team that you look at and consider to be the best athletes on the team. They, they cover the most ground. They do the most things. They, they are the, the generals of their positions, the shortstop kind of directing the infield center fielder, directing the outfield. So in that regard, you know, they have collected, uh, a, a collection of talented athletes. Uh, I continue to think that when you look at some of these people that are shortstops, uh, it's natural to to assume they're going to move. I still am not on board the L.A. De La Cruz shortstop wagon. I think that he is so young and he's going to fill out so much more that you're going to look at him in a year and a half and be like, well, that dude is a third baseman. I mean, he's going to be big. He's going to be bulky. Uh, he's not going to continue to be kind of that beanpole. And it's just going to be a natural move. It's just going to take care of itself. Uh, you've got other guys. Uh, Matt McClain has played outfield already. He played outfield in college. He has already demonstrated that he can move out there if you need him to move out there. So there's another guy that you can move uh, and fill a need that the, that the Reds have. So for me, yes. 
bring in the most talented athletes you can find. And if they all have shortstop written next to him, that is not a hard fix. Right. And the important thing is, it's just talent. You want as much talent as possible. Then we'll figure out what position they play after that. Cause there's so many guys, like if you look up the top, up and down the top 100, whether it's MLB pipeline, baseball, America, whatever, when they have a player's name listed, they have their position next to them. Usually it's multiple positions. They'll be like, Oh, he's a second baseman or he's an outfielder or he's a shortstop or a third baseman or he's a first baseman or he's a catcher or, you know, stuff like that. It's just, they're always multiple different ones and the reds just went for talent and I'm okay with that. And I'll tell you this, there's some, I'm seeing a lot of questions jumping up about this. So let's go ahead and, and, and tackle this one right now. Quick reaction. Cause there's going to be a lot of people that we talk to. There's going to be a lot of folks who know farm systems, reds, farm system, things like that. So let's do a quick reaction. Top 10. I still think LA de la Cruz is number one. I, that may not be true. I think cowboy said it best today that, that he is no longer the number one prospect in the system. And, and that's going to hurt his feelings a little bit. That is going to motivate him. Uh, I I'm kind of interested to see what happens the rest of the way, because, you know, they brought in, you know, just in the, the trade with, uh, the, the Mariners, the trade with the Mariners again. No, listen, I think, <laughs> I think Marte <laughs> is a, Marte is a, a huge get. I think he may be the top one, two, prospect in the system Ellie de la cruz maybe two three uh you know you've got these pitchers in guys like williamson and connor phillips and chase petty that all sit kind of high up there and and really what we need to do is everything has happened so so hot and fast today jeff we probably need to do a whole segment in a show here in the next couple days where we take all of these players just just acquired and 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 really spend some time looking through their uh, their bona fides, their resume, and rank them out. Uh, there there's so many good guys right now that I think it's going to take us a day or two to digest everything that they've done. But to rank them one through five is a little bit hard for me right now because I really need to start digging into some really low minor league numbers and see what guys have truly been doing versus just what pipeline is telling me what they did uh so you know my quick my quick uneducated guess is is we we got guys back that are that are better than ellie de la cruz right now this second uh, ellie's gonna be motivated to try and surpass them and I, I really love the pitching arms that are working their way through the system right now in in petty williamson and, and phillips yeah, and you also have Andrew Abbott there as well. And you're going to add some dudes uh, to that list on the pitcher side. But also Spencer Steer and Christian Encarnacion Strand from the Twins in the Tyler Malley deal still have me very intrigued because it sounds like they're close. And we, we've seen that before and like guys like Scott Shebler and Jose Peraza who were close whenever the Reds acquired them and they just didn't really ever end up turning into something. So when I think about who's coming up, power bats like Steer and Encarnacion Strand really do um, excite me. And then, of course, Edwin Arroyo as well coming up. He is a young dude. He's, it's going to be a few years before we see him, but he is super talented. In fact, there's some, including our friends over at Lockdown Mariners, who may have disagreed with the fact that Noel V. Marte was the most talented player that the Reds got in that trade. They think Arroyo might have been. Um, I, I think it's interesting, though, when you look at the uh, the different players that the Reds got back and how it shapes the Reds' future because we've been talking about the 2024 is really the year that we're aiming for at least in our estimation of what we see from this team. I think the 2024 they probably are where the Baltimore Orioles currently are. The Baltimore Orioles and I'm not talking about their front office selling on them where they performed where they're like two and a half games out of a wild card spot. They're right there. They're they're doing their best to contend. And I think that the Reds will have that talent in 2024. Now, does that put them in the playoffs? They'll be close enough that they'll be in contention. And then 2025 probably be right there. But 2024 is where I'm looking for. And I think that the Reds only helped that prognostication today and in the days leading up to today. It's an exciting time. I know that there's a lot of the fan base out there, Jeff, that's, that's, beat down that's discouraged that's just just over the word rebuild and and i get it i understand where that comes from and you know just a word of caution this is unlike any rebuild we've ever seen in cincinnati <laughs> what has happened uh this because year they chose a path and they stuck with it correct and they right. and they executed it well 
I mean, <laughs> they, they've, they've chosen paths. They've stuck with them a little bit. But they've never executed them well. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. so yeah. So this is this is this is a, just a huge, just a huge difference in in what they've done before. Yeah. Twenty. Listen, I mentioned earlier that I thought they could be an outlier for the final wild card spot in twenty twenty three, and I I believe that's true. Uh, I, you know, I tweeted a few days ago. If you take what's left of this team right now, and in the off season you go out and sign a band aid or two of corner outfield that's a one to two year guy that's a, an experienced veteran and you overhaul this bullpen a little bit that team's a 500 team it really is with these young starting pitchers and what's left offensively that team could compete for the final wild card spot now i know i hear everybody i i can feel the collective eye rolling in cincinnati about who 500 team that's really what we're shooting for yes in 2023 that's exactly tw- a, a 500 team in 2023 would be like icing on the cake for what happened today because then they springboard into 2024 as all of this young talent starts to hit and all of the sudden the reds are one of the best teams in baseball with one of the lowest payrolls which would allow them to go out and actually address issues in free agency when they need a guy, one guy. I think the Reds would spend money to do that when they need a reliever, when they need a fourth outfielder, when they need a backup catcher. I think they would spend money for that then. So this this is the, the laying of a foundation, and we've talked about it being different. We've talked about there now being more work for Nick Crawl to do, and I think that's that's the next thing to focus on. What Nick Crawl does next, what player development does next, what the next few months look like in the auditions, because uh, if some of these guys show that they're valuable, uh, my outlook for 2023 just will continue to rise. Yes, and that's the key word for the rest of the season is audition, because we're in spring training 2.0. Wins and losses every day aren't going to be that big of a deal. Like, as much as I want the Reds to win every single day, I'm not going to lose sleep if they lose. Depending on, you know, what the situation is and things like that, I want to see how this team improves. I want to see how individuals perform. Are people giving up on the process? I mean... We've avoided using that term, but that's essentially where we are with the red legs right now is the process. We must trust the process. So when we look at these different things like this, and actually I did want to touch on this. This was a question I saw a little bit ago, um, uh, which we'll get to in just a moment. But when we look at how the reds are building, it is so key who they give playing time to the rest of the way, because these two guys right here, if we see a lot of Kyle Farmer at shortstop, the Reds are not preparing for the future. Uh, I agree. And I, it's why I threw this up here and I didn't mean to sidetrack you. I probably clicked it just a little bit too soon, Jeff. Sorry about that. Okay. But, uh, <laughs> but you know, the, the listen, Kyle Farmer's still here. I don't think he should still be here. They should have sent him packing for whatever they could get. Uh, but I get it. Uh, in all of the moves they asked fans to swallow today, I think keeping him around here was a little bit of fan service to try and appease a few of the of the fan base. Because uh, as I mentioned the other day, Barry Larkin has really talked up this guy, told him to put the captaincy on his chest, told him to give him a long term extension. God help us if they do well, that. Well, he could still be trading in the offseason. But he, he could be. He's not going to be. He's going to be here next season. If they were going to trade him, they would have done it today. Um, and buried it in all these other transactions. Uh, What this means is uh, maybe, just maybe, they will be willing to do with Kyle Farmer what they should have been doing with him all along. And that's spotting him in, make him your utility guy. He can cover some days at third base. He can cover some days at shortstop. I believe that he could cover some days in left field if you really had to. Uh, I'm not saying ask him to catch. Catch her. No, 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 no. That's ridiculous. <laughs> um, that is a full-time job. And yeah. <laughs> he would need to be working there every day. But if there's an emergency, you could stick him back there for an inning or two until you could call somebody up. But he does have to get out of the way. It's time to start auditioning pieces. And Kyle Farmer is not a long-term piece. So start moving him around. Make him your utility guy. Get some of these other dudes up here and get them playing time. As far as Solano goes, uh, I think he would have been a trade chip a la Brandon Drury, if he had had more playing time. Uh, I think we didn't get him back from that injury soon enough for him to be able to demonstrate to the other GMs out there that what he's doing this season is for real long-term. So I think that's why he's still here. So 
you know, you get him playing time this year, you use him. He's valuable. He can, he can deliver. You can win a few games with him this season. Uh, but again, he should move around yeah. and you should spot in the young guys that you're trying to audition in order to uh, see what you got. And I'm glad too, because tonight they have Nixon Zell batting second. I don't necessarily know if that is his spot moving forward, but I do want to see more from him. I want to see more at bats. I want to see how he continues to play this year and next year as well, because I don't know where he is on this team. I know that Cowboy has said before on the radio broadcast that he thinks that his time is over. There is no more Nixon Zell is our guy for the future. Like he's here because he's here and not because he's elsewhere. So when you look at that, you you talk about, you know, how does he fit into the 2024 plans? I don't think he does, but he could at least slip his way into maybe a fourth or fifth outfield conversation spot because the Reds do now have some guys coming up who could probably play in the outfield a lot better than Nixon Zell can. What do you think about this, Jeff? <sighs> uh Long, long gee Raider. I'm sorry. I, and for the audio listeners, I apologize. Uh, yeah. <laughs> jo, Joey <laughs> Votto. Comment, comment from YouTube is uh, Votto deserves better. Yes, he does. He absolutely does. And, and we will have a show in the future, maybe a couple of shows in the future, talking about this because this man has spent his entire career as a Cincinnati Red. He has continually affirmed his loyalty to this franchise and how much he, he will never ask for a trade. He will never ask to be let go or something like that because he wants to wear this Cincinnati Reds uniform until he retires. However, the Reds have done him no favors. The Reds have just never brought in the kind of team I mean, even 2010, 2012, they still had holes that they need to fill and they just didn't go fill them. When you look at Joey Votto's career, you will always look at a huge. What if, if you put him on the big red machine, Joey Votto is the most celebrated player in the history of this franchise. But because he played during the time period of 2008 to 2023, 2024, when the Reds went to the playoffs three times and two of them were super forgettable or four times and two of them were super forgettable, then we're going to look at Joey Votto as one of the coolest players of this franchise's history, but he won't get the respect that he ultimately deserves. And that is more on the franchise, not building around him than anything else. Charlie Day says, trade Votto to a contender, even though it would be heartbreaking. He will need a ring to overcome the bias in the Hall of Fame voting for sure. That's true if he was being voted on today. I think that in the next five, six, seven years before Joey Votto is eligible for the Hall of Fame, the voters is, is, is going to shift enough towards uh, the new voters to look at the advanced stats and, and listen. Joey Votto is a Hall of Famer right now. He doesn't need a ring. He doesn't need to do anything else. He could retire today and be a first ballot Hall of Famer. And I will fight anybody that says otherwise. I will die on this hill. Uh, that's, that's just the way that I believe it. Because, you know, here's the thing. David Smith says, and uh, this hurts me, Votto is at the end, I think. You know, Votto is at the end. Uh, we talk about trading Joey Votto. He doesn't want to be traded. He has no trade clause. He has to agree to a trade. And he has said on multiple occasions this season, that ownership has never approached him about being traded and that he wants to stay in Cincinnati. He says that. And I, you know, I know people that know Joey, you know, we've all heard Carlos Guevara say Joey Votto doesn't want to leave Cincinnati. He, he wants to stay here. So, you know, I respect that. Uh, could it have helped the franchise to move him, you know, maybe last season, probably, but uh, I don't think that he, thinks he needs that ring to validate his career. I think he wants a ring, but I don't think he thinks he needs it. And and I'm okay with that. So is Va is Votto at the end? Yeah, I think so. I think that he plays next season for the Reds. That's the 2023 season. And I think that there will be a negotiation. I think Joey's going to want to play in 2024. I think that he has a pretty big buyout on that contract if they don't pick up the team option for 2024. Yep. And we could maybe see a farewell year tour of Joey Votto in 2024 at a reduced rate uh, that sends him off. And that's kind of the direction I think it'll go. Yeah, and, and, and I, I totally agree with you. And that is really where Joey Votto separates himself as an individual is because in this day and age, you hear about a lot of players that want to go somewhere. They want to go chase a ring. They want to go find as much money as possible. Joey Votto's never thought like that. Joey Votto is not the brand of athlete that we see 
that permeates sports nowadays. And we are going to miss him totally. And, and I mean, he's still playing the rest of this year. He's still playing next year. It's not as if we're talking about him no longer playing for the Reds, but it's just in our, as we watch him in the twilight of his career, it's worth noting that Joey Votto has been an absolute joy to watch in his career as a Cincinnati Red. He's never gotten the team that he deserves around him. And whenever he retires, we need to celebrate him for the individual player that he was and not for the fact that he didn't win a ring, which in the sport of baseball is much, much harder than any other sport. You just ask Mike Trout. Exactly. <laughs> oh, man. Poor Mike. Poor, poor Otani and Trout, man. It's, yeah, that's a whole that's rough. Thing. <laughs> that's a whole. We could do a whole offseason like who are the guys you feel sorry for the most? It's it's man. No, I, I'm I'm totally with you, Steve. But I think on that a little bit serious note, but still, you know, celebrating note and things like that, very thoughtful note. I think that'll be where we end today's podcast. Thank you, everybody, so much for watching, and uh, thank you to those who will listen once we post the uh, podcast version of this here uh, episode. But Steve, as we conclude the trade deadline. Well, what's on your mind? What, what's your thoughts? Well, you know, I, I I just wanted to address that this is our this is our first foray, me and you, into the live show, and you know, obviously, we're going to continue to try and build upon that and tweak it. But I would love to hear some feedback from all you folks that are watching tonight. I, I see a total. There's a bunch of you out there tonight watching live, and I am I'm really glad you're here. Uh, shoot us a tweet. Shoot us a shoot us a comment on YouTube. Let us know what you liked, what you wanted more of, what you want us to do. Uh, I know that uh, Jeff, you've got some things in the works for some uh, live watching of games together over on Discord. So we've got some stuff coming for you folks. And I just wanted to make mention of it right now because uh, we definitely want to do it. We want to do it uh, the best that we possibly can. And we want to deliver the things that you all want to see and hear. So let us know. We want to hear from you. 100%. And that is how we'll end it. Thanks again. Uh, you will definitely want to check out tomorrow. We are going to be covering a lot about how this team moves going forward and a couple of key questions that David Bell needs to answer as well. That's all coming up on tomorrow's Locked On Reds. Now go check out Locked On MLB as Sully has you covered league-wide on everything, movements, transactions, and all about who's going to win the World Series. That's Locked On MLB, just like Locked On Reds, free and available on all platforms. Steve, the trade deadline's over. There's no more moves to be made because they can't. They're not really allowed to do it anymore. But there's still plenty to watch when it comes to the Cincinnati Reds. So what's that mean for you and me? That means the trade deadline may be over and done, but we're not done. We're going to be locked on Reds every single day.